Hello. Hello. Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Spot Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you being here. Today, we have a great guest on the show, Mr. Joseph Rosales. Joseph was actually with us in the beginning of this project back in season one. We had an amazing conversation about change and uh, in particular, how that change uh, impact or could potentially impact us all in the automotive industry. Um, today, we're going to be having a different conversation uh, focused around setting effective goals and how we can use goals to achieve more than we ever thought possible. Very excited to have you back on the show, Joseph. How are things, Ben? Fantastic. Loving the uh, beautiful weather we're getting out here in Arizona now. And uh, yeah, dude, everything's good. Went for a went for a fifteen mile bike ride today in the mountains, and it's perfect. Right on, man. Hey, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us again. I really enjoyed our our first conversation back in season one. A lot has changed since we got together back then. Uh, the show has been uh, um, picking up a lot of momentum, which has us very very excited over here uh, because you know it's a it's a way for us to connect with more people and and obviously fulfill our purpose and our mission, which is to help individuals in the dealership, um, you know, just achieve more, right? Um, right. so I, I think the conversation today is going to be a good one and I'm just excited to be able to share some insights so that, uh, folks can obviously utilize that information. Um, so let's kick things off, man. Um, you know, let's, um, let's get things rolling. So goals, right? Um, what is it all about? How can we use it in the automotive industry? Let's start kind of with a 50,000 view and work our way to a more granular, uh, type of, uh, an approach. Okay. That sounds great. Well, you know, I've been in the automotive space for uh, over 25 years, and I've had the opportunity to work with literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of sales consultants over the years. And and one of the things that we see all the time in the business is goals. I mean, you know, what's your target? How many you got to sell this month? What do you got to do? And obviously, there's there's so many you know, uh, books and, and programs out there to teach you how to, you know, be clear about your goals, how to write down, how to do all of the um, things that, that are going to help you achieve more. The problem is they fall short because most people set goals and they rarely achieve them. Um, and I use an example of New Year's resolutions. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are hundreds of people listening today that have set a New Year's resolution. You know, they got excited and they want to get in better shape. They'll make more money. They want to stop drinking or start doing something else, spending more time with their family, whatever it is. And what happens is they make an emotional commitment to a resolution. And if people are honest, most people rarely achieve those resolutions because 30, 45, 60 days in, they kind of forget about it. And so there's some real simple things that you can do in, uh, in, in, in your life, in your business to help you achieve more, to help you set more meaningful goals, more powerful goals and achieve more in your life. I mean, in, in your business. And, you know, a lot of people out there, they want to go from, you know, 12 or 15 or 20 cars a month to 30, 40, 50. Um, and it's achievable. It's totally achievable if you do the things that cause it to happen. And to do that, you have to have goals. And to have goals, you have to have a plan. So we'll get more into that in a minute. But that, that's kind of the, 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 the high look. You know, if you've ever set a resolution, didn't keep it, it's probably the same as when you set goals and don't make them. But so do you think the reason why that happens is because uh, do you think that we fall short on setting the right expectation and, uh, like you said, having that vision, that, that right vision or plan? And here's what I mean by that. So um, I'm of the philosophy that, as human beings, we, we like to try a lot of things. And what I mean is, mm. um, you know, we think that we want to achieve certain things in our lives, but we, we don't really, we're not willing to pay the price to achieve that thing. Right. And so right. there's a lot of trying, um, and there's not a lot of achieving because, you know, trying isn't enough to, to, um, you know, pick us up during those down times, during those, those challenging times. Do you think when it comes to setting goals, that's that that could be one of the, the main issues why we don't achieve it is because we're not really committed to that thing. It's just we feel or we think that that's something that we want, but we're not, we didn't really yeah. invest the time yeah. in figuring that yeah. out. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it would be nice to say that there's one 
thing that keeps us from achieving our goals or our aspirations. There's not. There's many, and they can layer on top of each other. But the, but the issue is if you're if you're clear about what it is you're trying to achieve, and then you lay out a very simple plan to to do the activities that causes you to achieve the goal, then you're going to be much more likely to achieve that objective, whether you're 80% or 90% or 100% there, you're going to be closer. And and I mm-hmm. think, you know, people get emotionally involved in setting goals like resolutions, and they say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, and then they don't have a plan, and they don't have uh, accountability. They don't have anybody to hold them accountable. As entrepreneurs, uh, as as small business owners, as as salespeople in the business, it's so easy to get distracted. I was just uh, we're working on this goals program that I took what, what, part of our conversation today. I'm now teaching as a goals program to dealer groups all over the country, and I took some things that we learn from a book called Goals, G O A L S, Goals by Brian Tracy. I, I've never read anything better than this book on how to set and achieve goals in your life and your business. And so I'm giving Brian a, a great plug on that uh, on that book. Oh, it's, right it's an on. amazing book. I've, I've I've read it twice now in the last two months. And and you know the the, the issue, as you say, is we we get distracted. You know, and, and in the car business, I was just talking about with one of my clients uh, just on Thursday. And we were, they've had a number of dealerships back east and, and, you know, the ability to set and achieve more, set goals and achieve more in their business is critical. And, and like every other dealership. But what was interesting is we talked about distractions and, and in the car business, there are so many distractions, yeah. not just people walking in and people asking you to do things. But new programs that come out from the manufacturer, uh, new programs or new policies that get implemented, new processes. I mean, there's constantly things going on. So people lose their focus really, really easy in the car business unless it relates to how many cars you sold this month. And that's what people do. I want to sell X this month. They either make it or they don't. But it isn't about setting the goal of how many cars you want to sell. It's about setting the goals to do the activities that cause you to sell more cars. See the difference? Yeah, I love. If that. I say I want to, I want, yeah, I, yeah, if I want to sell twenty cars a month or thirty or forty or whatever it is, okay, great. There's the goal. Well, what do you do to get there? That's where people get lost. They get lost on the activities that accomplish the goal. So when they get to the end of the month, if I hit twenty or twenty-one, great. Hey, awesome. I hit my goal. Or if I hit to fourteen or fifteen, oh well, I was short this month. I'll make it up, make it up next month. And they don't change anything that they do. The activities that would have produced the goals. If you want to get, if you want to have a higher closing ratio, you can't just say I want a higher closing ratio. You have to do the things that cause you to be more effective in your presentations, in your closes, in your in your entire engagement with that customer. That's going to then cause you to close more. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, totally. And and I love what you said about the activities, right? Because I think that there, there's something there. It's the little things that we consistently do that ultimately oh, yeah. c- cause change, right? Um, yeah, and yeah. so in your in your um, opinion, right, based on, you know, obviously you're consulting with, with a lot of dealerships around the country, um, you know, what do you see, where do we miss the most? Is it at the level of leadership and how they set the goals? Is it as an individual employee of that dealership? Is it a combination of the two? Like, where do you see that the disconnects are occurring in, within our industry when it comes to setting goals? And more importantly, when it comes to achieving the goals that we set? Well, that, that's a great question, uh, Herb. Um, I, I think you, you hit it when you said it's a combination of both. Um, most sales managers, that I've come across and I've trained with literally thousands of them. Um, Most sales managers have never really been trained themselves on how to set and achieve powerful goals and achieve them on a higher level. So it's very difficult for them to teach someone something that they've never done themselves. They've never been trained in themselves. We know this to be the case. Um, But 
you know, it's it, if a manager says to one of their sales consultants, hey, uh, you know, you need to be at 20 or I need you to do 25 or whatever the number is. And however they come to that agreement, whether it's a salesperson say, I want to do 20, the manager says, this sounds great. Or if it's a manager giving them a, a, an objective, it doesn't matter how we get there. What matters is, OK, now how are you going to get there? That's that's the question I ask all the time when I'm working with a dealer group and they're telling me all these amazing, fantastic uh, initiatives and objectives they have. And I say, that sounds great. How are you going to do that? Show me the plan. Mm -hmm. right. And often that's where it all falls apart. Well, we don't actually have a plan. We just we're just going to say we're going to do that. And we're going to push everybody to do it. We're going to work longer, you know, sell harder, do more advertising, do something more to create more opportunity. But they aren't really fixing the problem. They're just artificially inflating the volume of activity without getting people to be better at the activities. Um, you know, because somebody's been doing something for a long time doesn't mean they're good at it. You know that to be the case. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I, I ask people all the time. You know, so so hey, how long have you been playing golf? Well, I've been playing twenty years. Great. What's your handicap? Right. <laughs> and they go, I don't have one. Or what's a handicap? Yeah, right. I, I just go out and play for fun, or I don't keep score. Okay, I get it. Hey, God bless you. Go out and go out and play golf, and don't keep score, and have a good time. You're not going to make any money at it. You're not going to be good at it. You're just going to go have fun. And in, in the car business, you can go out and have some fun. I, I love having fun selling cars. But in the end, it's about making money. If you're not making money, if you're not supporting your lifestyle or your family or growing your investment portfolio or something, whatever you're doing with your money, then this isn't a hobby. This is a, this is a, this is a profession. This is a business. And I know people listening know that, but, you know, think about the simplicity of having some really powerful goals in your life, in your business, and then having a real simple plan that you could follow to achieve more, to improve those skill sets that you need to have to be able to do more in your business and, 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 and watch some amazing things happen in your life. I know that, you know, I, I, by the way, I have a, um, a summary that I would love to send to your listeners. Um, and if they want to text uh, uh, the word performance to 77948, they just text performance to 77948, they'll automatically get a download of a, uh, of a, of a two-page tip sheet on setting powerful goals and achieving more. We'll, we'll put that in the um, show it, notes it, too um, for anybody listening out there. So go to the show notes to look for that information if you're interested in getting that uh, that information from Joseph. Yeah, and it's free. It's free. There's no pitch. It's just some way we can help your listeners. Right on. Thanks, man. Sure, absolutely. So, so you know, there there's some things on this on this uh, tip sheet that I'm going to tell you about, and and I think the first one is really interesting, and this is a really important part of this conversation, and and it's that. You first have to believe that you can achieve these lofty or powerful goals that you want to set for yourself. For example, we have a dealer group back east, and they have nobody in their organization right now is selling 30 or 40 cars a month. No one, not one person. Wow. And they got a bunch of people selling 20. How, how like, what's, what's the size? Like, what, what, are, their, what are the numbers? As far as like how many people, uh, they're, they're how many cars? They're probably doing, you know, average in their dealerships, 200 cars a month. And they've got, and they've got, you know, they've got uh, 15 people on, on, on the, uh, on the floor. And I think the national average from NADA, isn't it like 12 or something like that? <laughs> uh, 12 per month that most um, think, people sell. Is that, is that the number? I think it's 10. So Okay, yeah. so 10. So let's say it's between 10 and 12. Well, 10 or 12, in my book, most commission and most uh, pay plans wouldn't allow you to live a very comfortable life at 12 cars a month in most markets. Right. So, you know, 12 cars a month would be like the dead minimum, even though that's the national average. Um, and so if you're doing 15, 18, 20, that's okay. Because everybody else is doing 13, 14, 15. So against your competition inside your own dealership, that sounds great. Yeah, but what about awesome. these people? And I know you've had them on the show. 
that are selling 100 cars a month. What are they doing that's different? Oh, well, they're in a bigger dealership. And, and I get all the reasons no. why people do what they do. But it's usually not. It's no. usually not. It's usually that they're doing things that other people aren't doing in a more effective way. 100%. I, I don't mean to – well, I do mean to interject, but um, – <laughs> Uh, we had Ali Rita on the show, so shout out to Ali Rita, um, the number one car salesperson for uh, in the world for 2017. I think he did over uh, 1,500 units or some crazy number like that. And one of the things that he said in the show that I just – dude, if I could just uh, find a way to – put that in front of every single person that's selling cars every single month. I, I, I would love the opportunity to do that. But what he said was so impactful. He's like, listen, you can't, um, you can't get to a hundred cars a month by doing what you did when you were set, when you were doing 20. So the goal is, or the, the process should be when you get 20, look at your process and see what you can do and see what you can do to shave some time to be more efficient. Right. And then when you get to 30, you do the same thing. And then when you get to 40, you got it. Every time you hit that mark, you got to look at your process again and see where you can cut some corners and where you can, um, you know, free yourself up to get that extra 10, that extra five. And it makes perfect sense. But I think that um, uh, in the industry, it, it, it's just, you know, we just we have this number that we want to get to. And once we we get to that place, it's like we just stop pushing for the next for that next level. And it's just, you know, it's yeah. unfortunate because opportunities exist to to do so much more. And it's such a powerful position uh, to be in. If you really think about it, when you're when you're when you're doing ten cars a month, that's pr probably not going to motivate you. But a lot, the Ali Ritas of the world, you think that Ali's ever going to want to be a manager somewhere? Or, hmm. No way, dude. Like he's got <laughs> that's the best role to be in. You you're the master yep. of your own destiny. You know what I mean? Yeah. So absolutely. Um, well, it's interesting. I was I, I I host a series of of mastermind groups here in Phoenix. As a matter of fact, we're going to be launching a national mastermind group for car salespeople and then another one for other professionals in other businesses. Um, and that's going to launch in January. So people can go to our website at theperformancegroupaz.com. And we'll put that in the program's notes too, but um, they yeah, can go and sure. find more about that. But, but it's interesting because I was at this mastermind and – during one of my facilitations and we're really, you know, uh, figuring out people's challenges and opportunities and uh, creating solutions. And um, I said to somebody who we were having a similar conversation about goals and about achieving more. I said, you know, the the first step to complacency is comfort. And what happens in business is we get comfortable. You know, we, we're not comfortable when we start because it's kind of stressful sometimes. But we get to our 15, 18, 20, whatever that number is, and everybody's saying, oh, you rock. You're top in the dealership. You're number one on the board. So we get comfortable. Yeah. We stay there. We, get, we, we stay there. And I, if I asked anybody listening to this program, do you feel you're complacent? Most people would say, no, I'm not because nobody wants to feel that way because that's kind of a negative word for many people. But if I ask if they're comfortable, a lot of people would say uh, yes. That's but see, here's yeah. what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. Any of us that are married know that you cannot become so comfortable in your relationship with your wife or your significant other that you become complacent. Because when you become complacent, you start taking things for granted. And you start thinking, well, well it's all good. I'm doing my 20 and I don't need to work any longer, any harder. So you get stuck there. And in a relationship and in a business, complacency is the death. But it hasn't, it, it, it's just starting. You're going to die at a slow death in business if you become complacent. And, and so, so how do we remain comfortable and excited and, and motivated and, and inspired in our business? And, 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 and be comfortable because we like comfort. And we all love comfort as human beings. I mean, it's who we are. We like to be comfortable. But when it morphs over into complacency, watch out. Because not much good ever happens when you're complacent, right? 
Yeah, I mean, you you just stop the growth, right? And and exactly. in my opinion, man, you stop learning. Yeah, yep. If, if you're not growing, you're just you're dying, right? You're going backwards. And yeah, exactly. Especially when everybody else around you is trying yeah. to do something. So <laughs> so you know one. God, I'm sorry. I just want to say one more thing. The one thing you want to really be careful of in the, our business, especially, is comparing yourself to other people. Because when you're at 20, and I'm just using 20 as a number because a lot of people think 20 is a good number. Um, if you're at 20 and everybody else is at 15, 14, 18 in your dealership, my, you're the rock star. You're, you're at the top of the heap. But don't compare yourself to the people in your dealership. Compare yourself to the people outside your dealership who are doing 30 or 40 or 50. Now, how good are you? Right on. Yeah. And, and I, I, it sounds a little harsh kind of, and I'm not saying we should always be completely driven all the time, but think about it. We, we just started a new program for one of our dealer groups back east where we're taking their top two people, the ones that are doing the 20 and the 18s, and we're putting them in a program to move them to 30. That's our first step. And if we can get some people to 30, because right now they have nobody doing in any of their dealerships. If we can get some people to 30, all of a sudden people go, hmm, 30 is not so hard. Ask anybody who's doing 30 or 50 or more. And they'll say, you know, it's actually easier than when I was doing 20. Right? How so? Because you got the system down. You, how so? Yeah, just because their process has to be flow. his process has to be spot on to get you know to push one a right. day. Oh, exactly, and and you know when you're doing 30, 40, 50, you probably get some support from somebody. Yeah, like oh, I, yeah. I would have an assistant. True, I'd have somebody doing my stuff for me. I wouldn't be doing. I mean, you know, those guys that are doing fifty plus, they don't do all the paperwork themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, you, just, you cannot process all the paperwork. That's what Ali was saying, too. That's part of, you know, not at this point. I think he had like three or four people in his team or whatever. But, um, yeah, dude, I love it because you know what? Um, the, the, the thing about that is that when you see others doing it, when you see that, that hey, you know, uh, this dude got to 30 or this dude got to 40 or whatever, then all of a sudden it becomes possible for you to do it, too. Right. Because until yeah, somebody yeah. else does it, you know, it's kind of like you limit yourself mentally. But if you see somebody else achieving it, then it just makes it more real. It makes it more attainable for you. And so right. um, I love well, that. Herb, Herb, at, at, Herb, at one point in the world, in the history of the world, no one had ever run a four-minute mile in the history yeah. of the planet. Right, yeah. And then when somebody did it, I don't know if it was 50 years ago or whatever it was, somebody did it. Now they do it all the time. High school kids do it all the time now. But see, until somebody had done it, nobody thought it could be done. Yeah. So same right. in a dealership. Just because nobody's selling 30 cars a month in your dealership doesn't mean – or 40 or 50 or 80. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that it's not being done currently. Right. Yeah. So so have that expectation. You got to believe that you can do it. You got to believe it's possible. You got to be clear about what you want. I'm going through some bullet points now. You got to write things down, obviously, because um, I was I was talking to somebody the other day and, and I said, so, you know, it's interesting to me when we talk about goals, we find that people, even when they write them down, even when they take that step, most people don't. They don't write them down. They just they're in their head. I, I used to be but like when that they write them down. Man. Like I never. Yeah. Used to, I used to think like, I, why? Like I know what I, where I'm going. I know what I want. So why am I gonna? Yeah. And yeah. and the process of actually yeah. writing down makes a huge difference. So I'm a big advocate of that now. But, gigantic difference. Yeah. Gigantic difference. But here's what's interesting. You can write them down, and put them on a shelf, or put them in a file, and stick them in your drawer. And now it's like you almost didn't write them down. You have to put yourself in a place where you're disciplined enough to look at your goals weekly. Some people say daily. I'm good with weekly. Weekly on Monday or Tuesday or whenever that is, you need to sit down and look at your goals and see my long-term goals, my short-term goals, those activities that are causing me to achieve these things. Am I on target with these things? Am I doing these things? Am I getting better at this? Am I gaining the resources and the skills that I need to be able to accomplish these activities so I can actually achieve more? If I'm not, then go back and look at that. 
you know, it's like business plans. I can't tell you how many people write business plans and they put them on a shelf and they gather dust. Yeah. What's the point? It's just an exercise, uh, mental exercise is all it is. But if you review your goals weekly and you're honest with yourself and you're, you're transparent and, and committed, then you're going to find some really interesting things are going on. Then you're going to say, you know what? I said I wanted to accomplish this, but I'm not doing the activities that lead to it. So I, I better, you know, step up yep. or just be honest with yourself and say, I really don't want that. Yeah. And that's what I was saying in the beginning, right? I think that we, we, sometimes we just think that we want something, but we're not willing to pay the price. And so after a while of trying to achieve it, we just, you know, it's just very easy for us to quit, right? And to go, you know, go on to the next thing. So I kind of want to um, move things along and ask you this question, um, but, you know, I'm trying to think how to frame it appropriately. So let me give it a shot. So um, I wanted to ask you, and I'm not, you know, obviously don't, don't give all your secrets away, but could you give us um, a, some sort of a template or something um, that you consider that you've seen or maybe that you teach in your, in your seminars about effective ways to set goals so that we can leave uh, something to the audience to, so that they can actually take it back to the dealership and implement that in their day to day. But before we do that, I wanted to mention something because um, I want to make sure that it's not conflicting or maybe, maybe you can, um, if you're, uh, I don't know, maybe you can kind of coach me on, 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 on this thought process. So there's this acronym out there when it comes to goals. I think it's called smart goals, like small, attainable, realistic, measurable, right? Something to that effect. And I hate that. I hate it so bad that every time I hear it, I just cringe, you know? I'm like, why do I want to have small yeah. and attainable? I want humongous goals. I want goals so huge, right? So massive, so big that just thinking about doing the work is like, whoa. Um, you know, and, and and I don't know, I just I just is that is that wrong? Is that do you think that, that acronym is is actually a, a good thing? Small steps over time get you the 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 vision gets you to get you to your objective or are we do we do we hinder and limit ourselves by by thinking small i guess is my well that that's a very very interesting question um i've i've been familiar with smart goals for decades uh actually the work that i do with Rutgers school of business um we teach leadership and management all over the world and we talk about goals and smart goal the s in smart small i've heard it as specific specific your yeah goals, that's what it is i'm sorry yes yeah, specific yeah, yeah. your your goals have to be specific and that for sure measurable the m attainable realistic and time oriented Smart goals really are very powerful because you can't have a goal. I want to. I want to make a hundred thousand dollars this year. Okay, great. You were specific and you were attainable. Are you measured? But okay, how am I going to do that? It's the how that is that that is is the real issue here. I I, I want to make a hundred thousand uh, dollars. I I, I want to do it by the end of the year. Great. Is that realistic? Well, yeah, it's realistic. Um, something, uh, another book, and I'm going to throw this one out there for your people by, uh, by um, Price Pritchard, uh, P R I C H E R T. Amazing book on, it's called U Squared. U and the number two, like uh, E's uh, equal whatever, M squared. Yeah. And it's all about growing your, your business or growing yourself or accomplishing more in in um in quantum um steps versus incremental steps for example in the car business people say it's going to take two or three years to 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 become proficient and get to where you're going to be successful right who said yeah who said I know people that walk into the business and in in in, in 90 days they're 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 number they're one on the board part. yeah happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to the old guard, the people that have been in the business for a long time, they're going to say, oh, it's going to take two or three years. You're going to have to grind it out. You're going to have to work bell to bell three days a week. You have to work your days off, yada, 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 yada. Who said? 
I, right now, we're, we're very much involved in conversations with our clients about completely changing their scheduling model and their, and their compensation plan. We're working with scheduling models and compensation plans in many dealerships across the country that are freaking 20 years old. Right? And, and, and there's so many variables. And I've, I've read some amazing things out there online from companies that are starting to see, let me, let me do this scheduling thing differently with my people. Let me, let me give some, some, some flexibility. Let, let's make our comp plan different uh, and, and more, more um, exciting, more interesting, more, uh, more immediate to people. My son, by the way, just I, I think you may I maybe you told you the story before. Um, my son is 21. He's a senior at Arizona State. And um, he happened to um, uh, stumble onto a summer job. Summer job working, you know, three or four months in the summer. And he made so much money the first month, the first summer. I think he made like twenty five thousand dollars in, in, in three and a half months. Right on. And for a twenty year old kid, that was pretty good. But this summer, this past summer, the one that we, we're now in October, and you know, this past summer that ended in like, September, um, he made seventy five thousand dollars in four months. Whoa! Selling door to door. Pest control contracts. No way. Not that's, sexy. That's amazing. Not, not, uh, but believe me, not a sexy job. But I'll tell you what, he works six days a week, eight in the morning till eight or nine at night, six days a week. And that's all he does is work for four months. And he, he's a millennial. Wait a minute. I thought millennials didn't want to work. I thought millennial. No, no. See, that's that old mindset that people say you can't do this because nobody's done it or this is how it's always been. Yeah. Oh, this is the car business. I, I, I tell you, I don't have much hair left, <laughs> but I pull it out every time I hear somebody say, oh, it's the car business. It's always been that way. I don't care how it's always been. I care about how it can be. How does it need to be to help us and our people become even better at what we do? The car business in the dealership level it has been around for a long time, and there's been some really amazing changes happening, occurring. I think I, in my other segment I did with you guys, uh, you know, last year, we talked about uh, the future of the car business and, and yeah. the coming tsunami of change in the car business being driven by consumers and technology it has nothing to do with what the dealer principal wants to happen. It has to do with what the what 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 consumers want to have happen. Consumers drive the process. We, we often just react to it. How about we get in front of that curve and start doing some really cool things with our people, with our customers, with our dealerships, and, and really change the way people view the experience of buying a car. Because I don't know about you, but if you ask 10 people, most people don't think buying a car is all that great an experience. Right, but and that's that's my biggest my biggest uh, pet, one of my biggest pet peeves is that dude. I want to challenge the leadership within the automotive industry to be bold, right? Mm -hmm. To be bold enough to do things yeah. differently, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah, it's so it's I mean it's crazy. It's such a simple thought, but if everybody's doing it the same way for the most part, right? And you change it up just a little bit. You do something that's a little bit different. I don't know. Maybe your service department stays open 24 hours. Or maybe you can pick up customers' cars yeah. or offer valet. Or I don't know what it is. Maybe your salesperson does everything from the, from the uh, demo to the uh, finance to whatever. If you can just change it up in a small way that differentiates you from everybody else. It's it's a different experience, you know. Absolutely. And so I love what you're saying right now because I, I, I think that it's it, it totally applies to our current our current state. Yeah. So okay, so kind of going back to this thing because I I, I, I want to learn for myself, right? So uh, do you think that when it comes to setting goals within the dealership, the smart approach that you think that that's a good uh, that's a good way, or is there a way that maybe we can tweak that a little bit to make it more applicable within our industry, or what do you think about that? Well, the document that I'm going to provide to you and to your listeners for texting uh, to that number um, is that template you're talking about. Oh, right on. Okay. It is several. 
it's 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 a, it's it's a, it's a it's a um, it's a uh, process of setting goals that will lead you down the path of obviously write them, make them realistic and attainable, all of those things that are important. But but my focus is always been more on achievement once we have the plan in place because where people fail is they set these plans and then they don't achieve them so they either say well the plan was too lofty or it was the wrong plan or people didn't do it or whatever it is and people you said this yourself people don't like setting goals because in the past when they did it it didn't produce right so obviously the process of setting goals is not important or else it would have produced. But, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. And you know now that you're starting to write your goals down and you're starting to achieve those or to, 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 to acquire those skills and resources that you need to be able to, to do the activities at a high level. It's no different than if right, – let, let's take an example. If you said, I want to get my golf game better. I don't know. Let's say say you're a 20 and you want to be a 10. Okay, great. What would be the process? I want to be a 10 and I want to do it this year. So that there's specific and that's time bound. But we it needs to be measurable. Now we need to go back and look and say, okay, how am I gonna how am I going to achieve these things over the next 12 months? I'm gonna have to go on a practice re regime that is different than the one I have now because if it's the same as what I have now, same what am I? Gonna do? Yeah, same. The same thing. Yeah. So if I have a different practice routine, maybe I start going to pro. Maybe I start filming myself. Maybe I start practicing more often. Maybe look at my clubs. Maybe I, I, there's, I mean, there's so many things that you would do if you really wanted to get your game to the next level. Same in the car business. Where are you in your skill set? Be honest, and maybe you meet with your manager, or if you're a manager, you meet with your, your, your GSM or your owner and say, hey, I want to take my game to the next level. You tell me what you think I need to do better. And I'll tell you, a couple of amazing things happen when you have that conversation. One is you tell your person who may be you know, uh, in, in a different position than you that I'm interested in growing. I want to be better. And what happens is you put yourself and them on some sort of alert. To, let's start getting better. And then maybe they share some things with you that may or may not be comfortable. You may think you're the best at X when really you're not so great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're selling your 20s, so everybody leaves you alone. But if you, I guarantee you, if you went to your boss and said, I want to go from 20 to 30 and from 30 to 40, what do you think I need to do to do that? And watch what happens. Watch them start to support your goals. It's amazing to me how many people will, from out of nowhere, will come to sell you and help you support, to help support you in achieving your goals because now they know that you have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's It's amazing. True. Plus your mindset you know, changes. People, oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. People Internally. talk about the energy yeah. in the world and how the universe comes to meet you. I don't know about all that. All I know is if I told you, Herb, I want to do this. This is one of my goals. And, and, and what do you think? You may have a perfect answer for me. You may not. But along the way, if you're lined up with me and what I'm doing and we're supporting each other, especially if we work together, then you're going to help me in ways I never even knew I needed. So, so you know, one of one of the other things, and I think at the, at, I think it's step number six in setting more effective and more powerful goals and achieving them, is creating accountability. If you are only accountable at the end of the month for talking about the numbers you made or didn't make, that's not often enough. You need, to, you need to create an accountability system. Well, I call it a layered accountability system because it may have two or three layers to it. You being more accountable, your boss being more accountable, other people around you being more accountable to, to help you saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to get to this place. And, and, and I haven't been doing the things I said I was going to do. Why these masterminds are so powerful that I'm running? It creates layered accountability. 
And every single month when you come back, we you said the three things you were going to do this month to help you get closer to where you're trying to go. And the very first thing we start off the next month is, so, so how would you do on your three things? You don't want to be the person that says, well, I didn't do them. Because we're going to say, well, then are you really serious? Are you really serious about accomplishing these things? If you're not, then just be honest. But if you are, then figure out the things that are going to help you do the activities that are going to achieve the results you're looking for, which means you meet your goals. Yeah, no. Because it's all about the activities right. that meet the goals, not just the goal. And, the goal is just a target. And like you said, be honest with yourself, man. Like, dig deep, right? Before you even set the goals, dig deep and figure out what it is that you want and why you yeah. want it, right? And then set the goals around that. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you don't want to be a yeah. 50-car guy, then don't, don't you know, um, don't set goals to achieve something yeah. that you're not really chasing, you know? Here's an interesting uh, statistic, and this, again, this is on the goal sheet that you guys are going to get. Um, only 3 to 7% of people ever set written goals. So let's just round that up to 10%. Only 10% of people ever set written goals. The other 90% just show up and hope something good happens. I come, to the, I come to the dealership. I work hard. I work long. I take as many ups. I answer the phone. I'm working on my skills. Uh, and hopefully something happens. Hopefully, hopefully I get to 20. That's not a plan. What's that saying? Hope is not a plan. That's a hope. <laughs> Hope is yeah, I love that. Write that one down. Hope is not a strategy, baby. But that's what people do. If I work hard and I work, you know, I work long and I work my days off and I, you know, I, I, you know, do some things that maybe get me a couple bones thrown away and I add a couple more here or there and I, I get it. But you know, if you if you think about it, 90 percent of people never take the time to write down where they're trying to go, and 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 how they're going to get there. And then measure themselves against the activities that are important to getting there and being transparent enough to say, you know, this isn't working. I need to change my plan. Only a very foolish person continues to bang their head against a wall that's not going to move. Well, but here, here, forgot another way. here's my frustration with that. So I'm of, the, I'm of the mentality that I will never change my objective. I will never lower or change my objective. Like I will die in the pursuit of my objective if I have to, but I'm going to, I'm going to achieve it some way, somehow. Now that doesn't mean that I'm going to do the same thing over and over again, because that makes no sense. Right. But the objective is the objective, man. Find a way to get there. If you're, what you're doing is not giving you the results and that just, it's an indication that you need to try something else, but why would you ever lower it? Or why would you ever make it, you know, simpler? Or why would you even go down that path? Well, well, that's interesting because um, remember, um, smart goals have to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, um, and time bound. Um, and the realistic, the R part of that is if somebody says, "Yeah, I'm going to go to 100. I'm at 15 today. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm going to go to 100 by the end of the month." Uh, you might want to rethink that goal right. and make it more stepped. And say, I'm at 15 now. I want to be at 30 by the end of the year. And then I'm going to go to 40 and, and have a plan. I, I you know, there, there, there's right, got to right. be some, some real estate. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, but I think. But the, but, but I think the final, the final, the final thing that I want to achieve, like that's never going to get smaller for me. I'm never going to be like, oh, this is, you yeah. know, I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm not going to get there now. So I'm going to, no, right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to track and adjust, right. I'm going to tweak things right. around to get there. But, right. you know, the, the objective is the objective. Right. Well, you know what's interesting? Another other thing you get, it talks about um, people have a fear of failure. Or people may think that they're unrealistic in saying, I want to do 50. Nobody in our dealer groups ever do 50. Nobody's doing 50 now. Be the first the top one. person is doing 23. See, the, see, see my point? 
it's like, oh, well, you know, if I say I'm going to do 50, they're going to think I'm nuts. You know, I just started like last year and they're going to say, oh, yeah, one day when you grow up, you'll, you, this is the car business. Nobody ever does it that way. No, have a different mindset. You said the word a little while ago and we teach a lot on mindset. I mean, mindset, if your mindset is not right, then a lot of other things are going to follow. If your mindset is not right, a lot of other things are going to follow that mindset. And, you know, I see managers all the time that say, well, you know, you know, my people don't want to do that or nobody's ever going to do that. Or we tell them all the time and they don't do it. So I just am tired of telling them. So I just lower my standards. And there is an interesting conversation. We could do, do a whole show on this where, you know, the standards that you set in your business, the way things are going to be your vision, if you will, for that your business, whether it was a manager, you as an owner, your vision that you set in place needs to be the vision that you're striving for. What happens is people often lower their 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 their, their vision to meet capacity or capabilities of the people working with them. Our dealership's going to do 400 cars mm -hmm. a month. Great, that's a great vision. But without the people to accomplish it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, no. So what happens is we get a bunch of people doing 10, 12, 15, 20, and we're sitting at, at 200, which is half of where we want to be. So we lower our expectations as business owners to meet the capacity of what our people are capable of doing. No bank's ever going to loan money on that. <laughs> no investor is going to invest in that vision because you're who's running the show here? Yeah. So, so in the end, you know, I think if somebody wants to do 50 and they're willing to sit down and make a realistic plan uh, with all the right strategies and they're willing to do the work and they're willing to invest in the resources to develop the skills, they may have to go to some seminars. They may have to hire a coach. They may have to, um, you know, put some money out of their own pocket because maybe the dealership is not investing in that type of training for them. But if you want to do that, you can do that because the resources are out there and a lot of them are free online. Yeah. So, so, so the point is you can achieve 50 if you're willing to have a plan and do the plan, do the activities that are in the plan. Yeah. That are required for you to it's be able to simple. reach that for sure. Exactly. Just saying it doesn't make it so. No, I totally agree. Hey, man, listen, it's been awesome to have you on the show. We're getting close to that time. Um, you know, it's always uh, educational. I, I really enjoy having conversations with you, man. Um, so I wanted to give you a moment. Um, I have one question left, right, that I ask everybody that comes on the show. But I want to give you a moment to let us know because I know you got some stuff coming up, coming up, and I wanted to, to let the audience know about that. So um, tell us all the good stuff that you got in the works, man. And by the way, we're going to put everything in the show notes and all Joseph's contact information in the show notes too. So you guys can reach out and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, call him or ask him any questions or whatever, you know, buy his books or let us know, man. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm super excited about uh, a, uh, another new book that I have coming out. You know, I wrote Customer Service as a Context Sport back in 2003. Uh, we've, we're following it up with Sales as a Context Sport. Uh, Leadership as a Context Sport is due out in December. Um, and so I've got a whole line of books uh, that are really all about sales and service and leadership um, because every and here, here's my mantra my mantra is every single business in the history of the world sells a product or provides a service I mean that's the purpose of a business with the exception of the IRS <laughs> they don't follow that model they just take it they just take money <laughs> you owe it to them they take it but everybody else all the rest of us we have to sell or serve customers and if you're gonna do that you're gonna have people and if you're gonna have people you need leaders and if you can have leadership, you're going to need a system to make sure that that's all following. And that's what we do. We focus. The name of the company, as you as you remember, is the Performance Group of Arizona. We do business all over the country, but you know, we, we have a, a really strong presence here in Arizona now. We're actually the leading consulting firm in Arizona for this kind of work. 
and it's it's been pretty amazing. We've only been here two years, and and but the, my company is thirty five years old. It used to be called the Sales and Service Group for many years, um, but you know we've got some cool things coming out. We've got new some new books coming out. Uh, you can go to my website, which you're going to provide that link to them. Uh, we've got our mastermind groups that are that have formed here in the Phoenix market. We're doing some national mastermind groups. Um, I'm I'm uh, doing a leadership conference here in Phoenix. I think next February. February, uh, all things leadership. We're only going to talk about leadership, um, and and you know we have a, a really amazing track record with managers helping managers understand the difference between managing process and leading people. And if you look at leadership, is all about developing and leading people. Managing is about managing process and making sure that we're making our numbers. And today's manager in a car dealership, the management team is under so much pressure from so many different areas, and, and there's so many reports. I see it all the time. I see managers with their heads buried in the computers all day long, trying to manage inventory, trying to make numbers, trying to do these things, making calls. And you look around, you go, who's leading the people? Mm -hmm. The people are leading the people. And if, if something sounds wrong there when the people are leading the people, the salespeople are kind of leading themselves other than, you know, the manager that says, you got to do this, you got to do that, or I need you to do that, or I need this number from you. So there's a whole different process when you get into developing people and leading people. That's really the job of a leader and a leader needs to lead and a manager needs to manage and you got to be both today. So we have this leadership conference coming in, I think, in February. Uh, we're going to be having people come from all over the country. We'll have some really interesting speakers. It's my conference, and um, it's it's going to be really amazing because if anybody's in the business of managing or leading people, they want to come to this thing. So we'll 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 get the information out to you guys, and people can get uh, they'll, they'll get the information on the tickets. Right on, yeah. So uh, lots, lots of cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, so make sure to go to the show notes. Obviously, we're going to post this live on Facebook. Um, so, you know, you can see the video feed there and on our YouTube page, but on the podcast portal where we have the show notes, we're going to put all this information so you can go there when this episode drops and you can get all that information. So, um, all right. So thank you so much for being here, man. I have one question left that I ask everybody that comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? It's a really great question. Um, I see the automotive dealership business because of the advent of all the new um, platforms where you can buy a car, um, whether it's, you know, car sense or whether it's, uh, you know, auto um, whatever, where you can go and buy a car out of a vending machine. Um, I mean, there's so many cool things. And, and today, people like Carvana, you can just have your car delivered to your house, and I don't have to deal with the dealership stuff. And that's going to change. I, I believe dealerships need to look at how consumers are engaged in other products, other industries, other brands and figure out what are they doing that we might do to make the buying experience different. Because the the cost of building and operating a dealership has not gone down, <laughs> it's going up. <laughs> the margins the margins that the manufacturers are allowing are going down, not up. And so you see this big chasm forming there. And more and more and more, we need to be, as, a, as an industry, we need to be super creative and super open to new ideas about how we might do some things differently. So I think the buying experience for a consumer that comes in the dealership is, is going to change dramatically over the next um, two to three years because they're going to demand it. They're just going to stop coming. Right on, man. Hey, there it is. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for your time today. I really enjoyed this conversation. That's all the time that we have for today. Um, if you haven't done so already, please, please make sure to share this podcast, uh, share this episode with somebody that can benefit from the information so you can take it back to the dealership and implement it in your day to day. That's all we got for today, folks. And as usual, we'll talk later.